People like to invent monsters and monstrosities. Then they seem less monstrous themselves. When they get blind, drunk, cheat, steal, beat their wives, starve an old woman, when they kill a trapped fox with an axe or riddle the last existing unicorn with arrows, they like to think that the bane entering cottages at daybreak is more monstrous than they are. They feel better then. They find it easier to live. What's up, bookworms? I am Mike, and today we're going to be talking about the first chronological book in Andrzej Sapkowski's The Witcher Saga, titled The Last Wish. Now, if this is your first time finding the channel, I do want to let you know that all of my book reviews are spoiler-heavy. Uh, I do a Let's Discuss segment once in a while. Those are spoiler-free, but all of my book, rev my book reviews, I'll usually kind of run down the plot, go over the key points, or just... Basically, just all the best points. I'm going to go over them. So if you have not read The Last Wish, uh, make sure that you uh, bookmark this video and come back after you do so because, uh, spoiler, I'm gonna, you're going to want to. Uh, with that said, let's talk about The Last Wish. Now, first, a little background on why I decided to read this series. Uh, like a lot of people, I am a very big fan of the video games that have been very, very popular. Uh, started with Witcher 2. Witcher 3 seems to be the one that got a lot of new people into it. Uh, honestly, I had Witcher 2 for like a year. And when I saw the E3 trailer for Witcher 3, I was like, hey, I guess I should go play 2 because this looks awesome. And if I play that, I'm never going to go back and play 2. So I'm not one of those that's like, oh yeah, I was a fan of this series long before because I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't learn until about two years ago that those games were based on these books and not the other way around. See, I thought it was kind of like the Halo books where they were just kind of capitalizing off of the success of the game. So I I am no by no means standing here telling you, yeah, I've been a big fan of these books forever. You know, I, I'm not doing like a, like I did with Game of Thrones for years and told everybody, hey, yeah, and I, I read this series long before you guys had even heard of it. Uh, so we really know that here. Uh, but when it was announced that they would be making a series of this on Netflix, I went ahead and I got... All the books on on digital versions because the hard I only I only buy hard covers and the hard covers in America are quite difficult to find or very very expensive so I said you know what I'm going to settle for the digital version on these and uh, the whole reason uh, I want to read this before it comes out on Netflix is because I want to be able to gripe hello I mean then the whole point of this uh, but. Uh, like my Wheel of Time plan, I, I just kind of, I want to stay ahead of the TV series. I'm not looking to speed read the series or anything like that. Like uh, with Wheel of Time, I originally had said I want to do like, you know, like the rumor was that they were going to be doing two books per season. So I was like, okay, I just want to stay ahead of the show. So I'm just going to read the first two. I ended up reading six. So uh, just like with this, I'm sure I'll end up reading, you know, three or four of them before the series actually drops, which is rumored to be December at this point. I just want to see a trailer. At this point, you know, I, I want to see something besides that horrible makeup test they had with Henry Cavill, where he had the big poofy wig, and that's that'll be that'll be a let's discuss on the on the Witcher TV series, and, and it'll be much much better after I finish reading these books. But uh, you know, unlike most folks, you know, who 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 don't like to watch the movie after reading the book, because like, oh, it'll never compare to the the, the movie that was in my mind's eye. I I, I kind of always do it this way. Uh, as you can see behind me, I'm a very, very big Stephen King fan, and I'm used to adaptations of his work always being disappointing. <laughs> so, uh, so I almost always read the book before I see a movie or a TV adaptation of anything now. It's just the way I am, because you know, you know, you certain things that you're like, oh, I want to see if they saw what I saw when I read this. I want to see if the, if the filmmakers can do that. And most times it doesn't happen, but you know, there are some cases where it works out really well. Uh, so yeah, I always always read the book before seeing it it's adapted. So with that said though, I did go into this book by wiping everything that I know of the storylines from the video games out of my mind uh, because I know most of those plot most of the plot lines in those games are based off of stuff that are in these books. Uh, I might be wrong on that. I'm not sure. Some people have said that they take place after the books. I'm not really sure. All I know is that, the games aren't canon to this, these books, apparently. So I was like, okay, I'm scrapping everything except like character names and, and cities. 
Uh, I'm, I'm wiping that out of my memory. I don't want to create like an alternate timeline here. You know, this is like an Earth Two situation. So uh, besides hearing like the voice actor uh, that voices Geralt, uh, besides hearing that in my head, uh, I, I went into this with the idea that this is just going to be something completely new. And hey, cool! I got a good starting point with I've already have a primer on the on the main characters, what a Witcher does, and, and that's about it. So. Uh, Let's go ahead and talk about The Last Wish. This is going to be a little shorter than most of my book reviews because this is a very short book. Uh, the Last... It wasn't... This this wasn't published first in the series, but for new readers, it is highly recommended they start here. I went to the Witcher Reddit, uh, talked to a lot of people on Twitter, and they all said, yes, here is the reading order, and they gave me these two short story books before you start the original series. So, uh, okay, uh Let's see what happens here. That's, what, that's, that's the attitude I had. So this is just a collection of six short stories. Uh, each one has kind of an interlude to kind of introduce readers to this world and some of Geralt's friends and allies. And, and I have to say, someone who doesn't really care for the whole Monster of the Week format, you know, I spent years being a Star Trek, the original series fan, uh, years being an X-Files fan, uh, Angel, Buffy, Supernatural. I, I don't need Monster of the Week stuff. Just give me like a continuous storyline. But I had an awesome time with this book. Uh, if I if I didn't already know characters like Geralt and Unifer and, and Dandelion and, and King Foltest, uh, you know I don't I don't know what I would have thought. I, I felt like this was a prequel story to the games that I love because you know it was uh, mostly original stuff. So I was all good with it. Uh, I would like to know you know how I would have felt about this if I had never felt the games. I would have had as good of a time. You know, I mean, I guess we'll never know. It's a little too late for that because uh, I can't really erase those from my memory because um, Witcher 3, game of the generation, I stand by that. So I, I know I said I wiped the game's plots from my memory before starting these. <laughs> and when you know it right off the bat, the first story, uh, simply titled The Witcher, uh, it, it, it's based, it's what one of the, the quests, my favorite quest in Witcher 3 is based on. You guys have played it, probably know it as the Bloody Baron quest line but you know instead of the baron it's king foltest and basically Geralt has to try and cure uh foltest's incestual daughter uh who was born a striga uh which is just like a crazy little hell beast that comes out at night and kills people uh you know the king he wants her cured it's his daughter you know not killed uh Geralt says he'll try but you know he's like look I'll try, but I'm not going to like not defend myself if, if need be. And, and, and you know, short story short, he he, he needs to. Uh, he's able to cure, you know, about before he gets a really really nasty neck wound. And this is what really kind of leads to these interludes, which are called Voice of Reason. Each one of them uh, between these short stories, where he's recovering and he's reminiscing about these uh, short adventures, or doing a "Hey, remember when this happened?" kind of conversation with Dandelion or, or Nineke. If I'm saying these names wrong, guys, I'm just going off the games. If that's wrong, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, I believe Nineke was in Witcher Two. Uh, I'm not going to go through each individual story here like I usually would in a book review, just because there's just too much. Um, I'll touch on the stuff that I really liked. Uh, and grain of truth. We know we get to see Geralt, uh, he fights a Bruxa, a uh, really cool character from the game. Again, this is, I, I know all these characters from the games. I, I, it would be impossible for me not to reference the games. I'm sorry. I know I said I was wiping that clean. I keep going back to the games. Uh, but I, I know what some of these monsters already are. I know what a Striga is. Or I know what a Bruxa is. You know? uh, but he, when he uh, he fights and kills this Bruxa, and, which is basically like a vampire, uh, this in turn cures Nivellen, this this man who has like been turned into a, some kind of a beast, which Geralt determines is not a monster. So he decides not to kill him. But, uh, you know, this man was questioning before he was cured if he even wanted to be cured. Because, you know, before he was he was weak. He was just a normal man. You know, he had bad teeth and all that. Now he's, like, super strong and has strong teeth. And women actually are, like, intrigued by him and stuff. And they never would have given him a second look. So, you know, each one of these stories kind of feels like it has something like that where there's, like, a moral point to the story. It's a nice little touch. Uh, especially in Lesser Evil. Uh, this one, uh, I know off of the casting for the Netflix series, some of the characters that have been casted, that this story is getting adapted in that first season of Witcher. Uh, so, I mean, Renfrey, Shrike, whatever you want to call her, Renfrey, such a cool character, man. I hate to see her go so soon. Uh, seemed like her and Geralt really had this connection and an understanding of it. You know, it's, it's, shit happens. You know, but the story basically tells us that, you know, killing the lesser evil is by no means not an evil act upon itself. And, you know, Sapkowski will do a much better word of putting that eloquently. Uh, but, you know, it hits hard on an emotional level. 
especially uh, Renfrey's last words as she's as she's dying in Geralt's arms. It's it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Uh, a question of price is a story. You know, I was like, yeah, that's pretty good. It's okay. I'm enjoying it. It's a, you know, kind of like a royal court here. Okay, whatever. Uh, let's see what happens. And then my eyes about pop out of their head at the end when I realized that these are Siri's parents. If you played a uh, uh, Witcher Three Wild Hunt, you know who Siri is. And but more importantly, you find out why it is that Geralt has the rights to her to train her as a witcher upon her birth. Kind of like a, a Merlin thing there with, uh, with, with, with Uther and Egraine saying, you know, I'm going to take, you know, you got to give me something. And he ends up taking Arthur. Uh, that's the parallel that I drew with it. All fantasy is going to come back to Arthur in some way or, or Lord of the Rings, it seems like. But uh, just really, really cool for folks who have played Wild Hunt. Again, I'm not sure if it would have had that kind of an impact for a reader coming in fresh. So... Again, I can't really say. Edge of the World is a, is a fun introduction to Dandelion uh, because one thing I never understood playing it was just like, how the hell are these two friends? I mean, this is oil and water. These guys could not be more polar opposites there. But uh, it, it's good. It's seeing how, you know, it seems like they've been friends for a long time. And it, it just kind of goes to show, you know, yin and yang. It, it works out really well. And, and, and a lot, I mean, Think about a lot of your friends. You know, you got a lot of friends that are in common. You got something you're looking at it on paper, and you're like, dude, we have nothing in common. How are we friends? And it's just going to be what's going to be. But, you know, this one goes really dark, though, because you got the elves come down from their mountain, and they talk about how, you know, elves and men killing each other is inevitable. And it, it basically takes the, the queen of the fields, this, this basically this deity, just intervening to keep Geralt and Dandelion from being executed here. So I'm thinking uh, the dark elves... Uh, is it Dark Elves or Blood Elves? I might be getting my lores mixed up here. Uh, Teruvial and Philavandrell, I believe their names were. Uh, I, I'm thinking we're going to be seeing them again in future novels because there's a lot of foreshadowing here. Uh, the Last Wish is the longest story in this collection, and that's because it has to establish the never-ending drama that is Geralt and Yennefer. Now, when I played the games, I always did the romance plot with Triss. Uh, one, because I'm a redhead guy, but two, because she seemed like the gal that was actually in love with Geralt. You know, Yennefer always seemed like, you know, she was running and she just wanted to be chased. And personally, I'm 40 years old, man. I'm too old for that stuff. I don't, I don't play all those games. But, uh, you know, when I play these video games, I, I always went with Triss. You know, whatever. But whenever I would say that, book readers would jump down my throat and be like, read the books, bro. Girl, you know, for forever, and I might be going a little over the top, but you get my point. They were always all up. You don't understand. This is this, this, and this in the book, and in the books, you know, this happens, and this is not. Okay, okay. I'm just going off of what I know here. It's a very small sample size. But, I mean, this relationship just looks toxic as hell to me from the go. Yin is manipulative and self-serving and, and just a braggart and a loudmouth, and I still don't get why Geralt's final wish from the Jin is just to be with her. I mean, she must just be just like a knockout. Like, I think he, like, says, hey, look, I can look in her eyes and tell that she used to be a hunchback. So I, <laughs> uh, it got a little convoluted here at the end where I was like, okay, I mean, I understand what's going on. I'm just trying to figure out why is Geralt making this choice? I, did he really think that was his only way out? But you know what? Hey, to put it bluntly, I guess the dick wants what the dick wants. And by the way, Geralt is a James Bond kind of man whore in this. I mean, this is a pretty short book. Uh, my digital version was like 233 pages, I think. And Geralt gets with like three or four women in this. So, I mean, life on the lo road gets lonely, I, I guess. And I, I don't know. This, it's just guys just got like a root beer flavored you know what or something. But all in all, you know, I think this is a wonderful introduction to this world. And, you know, even though I know that I don't know what the first release now, I think it's called Blood of Elves. Uh, I don't know what that first novel starts like, the original story. But I have to say, I definitely think this is the place to start for new readers because this was every bit of a page turner. It didn't just try to throw a shit ton of lore at you and be like, "Hey, you'll 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 learn as you go along." It really. It sets up this world. It's a really, really good introduction. And like I said, just a page turner, man. I finished it in a couple days. You know, and I would have picked up the next short story collection if I didn't have a reading schedule that I've locked myself into. But I'll get to that in a minute here.
But uh, next, in this, next in this series is uh, Sword of Destiny. It's another set of six short stories. I expect this to be kind of similar, where it's character introductions, more monsters. Maybe we'll see some more about uh, Kaer Morin, see how, how the Witchers are, are, are trained and whatnot. And uh, maybe touch on some of that fancy gear and the oils and all that kind of stuff, you know, concoctions. All that cool stuff that, that, that we love from the game that I'm sure that these guys that made these games were very clearly big fans of these books. So everything that's in that game, I'm pretty sure they got from somewhere in these books. Uh, so if they are anything near as fast-paced and fun as Last Wish was, I am in for a treat. Because this was really, really good, guys. I really highly recommend checking out. I'd like to know what you think if you haven't played the games and you read this. I'd like to know your opinion on it. If, if it... If it is as fun and fast-paced for you as it was for me. But like I said, I am trying to stick to a schedule right now. You know, I, I felt like I was really locking myself down with so many Wheel of Time books. And not that they weren't good, but they're, you know, they're, they're tomes, you know. And that, that, that felt like that was really just locking me down. If I'm trying to keep this, you know, one video per week kind of pace here, uh, I people have asked me, how do you, how do you read so much? Look, I, I, I do an hour transit to work each way. Uh, and that's that's an hour reading time each way. I had an hour lunch. So there's three hours reading time, plus I usually read before bed. So, you know, I'm reading almost four hours per day. So, obviously, I'm, I'm able to knock down these books pretty quick. Uh, but, you know, with Wheel of Time, I, I really, really just felt like I was locking myself down. And uh, so I decided I was going to, you know, branch out, stop tying myself down to one series at a time. I'm going to read a lot of book ones, and then when I'm done with those, go to book twos and kind of read out some series that way, uh, try to keep things fresh. Uh, problem is, now I'm reading the books faster than I can make a video for them because, you know, all that travel time for work and stuff, the last thing you feel like doing when you come home is, hey, let me uh, let me, let me me put together like an hour video here. Uh, not an hour. I'm exaggerating. Don't, don't listen. I'm rambling here. But uh, I'm reading books now, like I said, faster because a lot of them are much shorter than Wheel of Time uh, or a First Law book. Uh, I've already finished book one in The Demon Cycle by Peter V. Brett. Uh, it's a very, very interesting series. Uh, so far, I've gotten a lot of polarizing comments about me reading it, though, about how people were not satisfied with it going forward. But, you know, different strokes for different folks. I, I read book one of Red Rising by Pierce Brown. And I'm about halfway right now through book one of Brent Weeks' very highly recommended uh, Lightbringer saga, uh, The Black Prism. Very, very good. I'm about halfway through that. It's, it's really good. Um, I was waiting to start that one until uh, the series was going to be finished. And the last book's coming out in October. So uh, I already like it better than I like the Night Angel books. <laughs> I got to do a review for Night Angel someday and tell people why I didn't like that. Because when I tell people I didn't like those books by Brent Weeks, they just kind of look at me like I'm nuts. So... Um, We'll see. So uh, look for those videos soon as I try to catch up here. Uh, the best way to do that is to help me out in hitting that subscribe button. The channel is growing really rapidly, you know, and I'm, I'm we're slowly climbing towards that goal of 500 subscribers. Uh, may not seem like much to anybody else, but when you know you do this completely by yourself and you're just a dude with a microphone, you don't do any fancy graphics or music or not funny or any of that stuff uh that's that's quite an achievement in my opinion i felt like that was a attainable goal 500 subscribers uh the reason i have that goal is because you really cannot beat youtube shitty algorithm that will not allow you know my videos to pop up in a basic search unless you have at least 500 subscribers so uh like for example you could type in uh the witcher the last witch re re review and my review would not come up, even if you typed in the exact same title. So if you could help me out there, please subscribe. Check out the other content on the channel. I do a Let's, Disc Let's Discuss segment every single week, which talks about an author or a book series and why you should read it, or a book review every single week. And we do a live show each, each week where we talk about everything relevant that happened uh, in geek pop culture over the course of the week. So please hit subscribe, share these with your friends, and I will talk to you guys soon.